Welcome and let's first talk compliance. I'm Catherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager at First Healthcare Compliance. Thanks for tuning in. You can follow First Healthcare Compliance on Twitter at FirstHCC or on Facebook and Instagram at First Healthcare Compliance or hashtag First Talk Compliance. On today's episode, we're talking with Courtney Tito, Esquire, a member of the Health Law Group at McDonald Hopkins LLC in its West Palm Beach office about payer disputes and audits, observations and strategies. Our discussion will help listeners better understand the payer audit process and prepare the organization to respond. We will talk about the payer audit process from the government perspective and compare and contrast typical government audits with typical commercial audits. Finally, we will identify some best practices that providers can implement now to prepare for payer audits. So Courtney, let's get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Can you provide a brief overview of the Medicare appeals process for overpayment demands? Sure. So there is a five-level administrative appeal process that Medicare has set up that is triggered by a letter that a provider will receive called an overpayment demand. And the first level of appeal, once you get that overpayment demand, is the request for redetermination. And you have 30 days to file this request for redetermination from the overpayment demand if you want to prevent recoupment, which is when the MAC starts taking back money from claims that you are currently processing. The MAC has 60 days to issue its decision once they've received your request. And once you get that decision, you will, the next level is the request for reconsideration appeal. This goes to what we would consider the sort of the first step of being an independent evaluation because it gets it away from the max who have originally looked at the claims that are at issue. And again, in this case, you have 60 days to file your reconsideration request if you want to continue to prevent recoupment. The QIC has 60 days to issue a decision, and if they can't get it done in time, then they will send you a letter and let you know that, and you have the option to escalate it to the next level of appeal. We're seeing that more and more often at this level, that typically the QIC is coming back to us with that statutory notification saying that they can't get this done in time. The next uh, level of appeal is the request for an ALJ hearing or an administrative law judge, judge hearing. Statutorily, the ALJ is supposed to set a hearing within 90 days, and I'm not sure if you all have seen, there's been a great deal of press on the significant delays that are um, occurring at this level of the appeal. The most recent statistics that I've looked at, those delays are at nearly four years, so um, they are well beyond their statutorily mandated time frame. You do, uh, they do again have 60 days to issue a decision or you can escalate. The next level of appeal is the Medicare Appeals Council. And once you get through that level, you can appeal to the federal district court, which has really significant restrictions on what can be reviewed and how to review it due to judicial deference that's owed to administrative rulings, which is what the Medicare Appeals Council ruling would be considered. I just wanted to point out real quickly as well, though, that This whole overpayment demand process is actually really started much earlier um, with a medical records request. And usually these come many months, sometimes over a year prior to the overpayment demand. So it's really critical that providers pay very close attention to those records requests and are really diligent in responding to them. So given the delays in the process, has CMS done anything to curb the delays? Yeah, there's actually been a recent case that's come out of um, the district court in the District of Columbia that's mandated that CMS get rid of the backlog. And they've worked hard or have made efforts to work hard to overcome these delays. And they've set up a couple of programs that allow you to settle some of these overpayment demands and appeals through a couple of different processes. Um, One of them is an OMHA settlement conference facilitation. The problem with a lot of these things that CMS has set up is they're very restrictive as to who can make use of them. So, for example, for this SCF or settlement conference facilitation, it's only for people who have filed requests for hearings. It's for Part A and B providers and suppliers. um, And there's really specific requirements, eligibility requirements. You can't have filed bankruptcy, certain things like that. So, 
um, it will limit and restrict who can go into those processes. But you go through the process and a settlement offer is given and you can sign off on that and be removed from the process. If you choose not to settle, then you would go back in line for the appeal process where you left it. There's also an express off option as well that's meant to go much more quickly. So that's one option. The other one is an Omaha statistical sampling option where an Omaha statistician will pull a random sample of the claims that are at issue and an administrative law judge would adjudicate those sample claims and the outcomes are extrapolated and then they present you with an offer and there's no room to negotiate on this so it's a take it or leave it sort of option. A third thing that has been developed by CMS is really outside of the administrative appeals process and it's meant to help prevent the number of overpayments that are being paid out. And it's called the Targeted Probe and Educate or TPE program and it's MACs are issuing letters to certain providers and suppliers with a history of high claim error rates or unusual billing practices. And it's a three-round process that allows the provider and supplier to improve their claim accuracy. And the way it works is the MAC will send a letter and say, you've been selected to participate in this program, and we are going to send you, you we've requested you know, between 20 and 40 claims send us the records on them, and we'll decide if those claims were accurately paid or not. You'll then get an outcome letter from that that will tell you which claims were accurately paid, which ones were not, and will give you um, an error rate. And the goal of this process through the three rounds is to significantly improve that error rate so that it gets smaller and smaller. And if you come back in the first round and you've done a great job, then there's no second round. But if you have a low error rate and then you'll go through the process again, and there'll be a second round where the, you'll do the exact same thing for different claims. If you go through the process three times and you don't significantly improve that error rate, then you will be referred to CMS for um, an overpayment demand. Okay, so how is the appeals process for overpayments for commercial payers different than this for the CMS process? Sure. So the CMS process is an administrative process that's set out by um, statute and regulations that come from the government. Commercial payers, um, that billing and um, process is really set out by contract, right? You have a payer contract if, in, if you're in network, and if you're out of network, you're still agreeing to um, receive certain rates and abide by how they bill things. So you're still nine times out of ten subject to the provider manuals that the um, payer has, you know, United Healthcare has provider manuals. They have an administrative guidance manual that applies to everybody, and then a lot of them have specific provider manuals for physicians or hospitals or laboratories that have more tailored billing requirements. And then they also have medical billing policies. So, for example, Cigna has a toxicology testing policy that prohibits pasture billing or that may prohibit the number of confirmatory tests that you can test within a certain time frame. They may prohibit professional component billing in certain circumstances. The actual process itself typically will start the same way. You know, you usually get a medical records request. Sometimes they'll go straight to the overpayment demand, but how the process proceeds from there is really dependent upon the commercial payer and is really going to be dependent upon the contract, the provider manuals, the online billing policies, et cetera. So you're going to really need to be diligent about reviewing that documentation and min maintaining copies of those documentations. We have a lot of clients and providers who aren't able to find those contracts, which makes things difficult. The good thing about the commercial payer process is that they can typically re be resolved through settlement negotiations. And so from start to finish, some of these can be resolved in less than a year, whereas the Medicare appeals process can take years and years and years and have no resolution. What do you think is the most important part of the appeals process? I would really say without question, it's the medical records request. And this is true um, regardless of whether it's a commercial payer or a federal payer, Medicare or Medicaid or TRICARE. Most commercial payers and definitely Medicare are relying on data analytics to target providers who they want to audit for whatever reason. And they have these very sophisticated software programs where they can enter in data points that they think will be relevant to compare you against your peers. 
who they define your peers to be is entirely up to the person who's setting up the search. Once they do this data and analytics review, if you pop as an outlier, for whatever reason, valid or not, they're going to send you a medical records request. And that request will come to you and they look very innocuous and they ask for, you know, anywhere from 40 to 60 records and most providers ignore these or they have clerks in their mailroom or billing clerks who don't understand the significance of the response to this request and they will just simply send whatever is in the most easily accessible file for that beneficiary for that date of service and wipe their hands of it and be done. The problem with that is it's from the review of those records that come in the response and the determination by the payer as to how many have, should have been allowed or denied that the payer is going to make its determination of what overpayment is due. And these are typically extrapolated amounts, meaning that the request will be for 40 to 60 records within a specific date of service range, but assuming that the payer decides that after they've reviewed these records that only 50% of these claims should have been allowed, then using a pretty sophisticated statistical algorithm, they will extrapolate that 50% denial rate over all the claims within that date of service range. So suddenly you're moving from 20 records to 2,000, 4,000, 20,000 claims over a range. And a simple nine to $10,000 actual overpayment from those 20 to 30 claims can quickly be extrapolated to a six or seven figure overpayment demand. So we really do recommend that all providers have a policy in place for how to deal with medical records requests to ensure that they're thoroughly and efficiently responded to and to make sure that the training is in place so that these clerks or whoever's handling the mail or responding to these does more than simply respond with what's in your files. So for example, if you're a lab provider, what will likely be in your files is a record is a requisition, the test results and the claim form. But really to have these claims allowed, you need to go back to the referring physician and get progress notes from the uh, relevant date of service, the prior date of service and the date of service after. And a lot of providers don't really understand that really comprehensive response is required to these records requests. Okay, thank you. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to First Talk Compliance, and my guest today is Courtney Tito Esquire, a member of the Health Law Group at McDonald Hopkins LLC, about payer disputes and audits, observations, and strategies. I've heard about the 60-day rule and the Reverse False Claims Act. Can you provide us with some more general information about that? Sure. So everyone who is a provider in healthcare should know that statutorily, they can't keep Medicare money to which they're not entitled. This statute has been in effect for a long time. Right. In 2016, CMS issued a final rule for Part A and B providers, which provides a framework for how that money must be returned to CMS. And what's really key about this regulation and this statute is that if these providers don't follow it, they would be subject to false claims liability. And that's why it's sort of called reverse false claims because it's the provider's responsibility. It's not coming from the government. It's the provider's affirmative obligation to return this money. And if they don't, they can be subject to false claims liability, which is treble damages, it's civil monetary penalties, it's um, revocation of enrollment, it's potentially criminal charges. So this is a pretty serious regulation that a lot of providers just really aren't aware of. So the key points of these regulations are that, again, it puts an affirmative obligation on providers to investigate credible information of an overpayment and report and refund that overpayment within 60 days. Again, or the provider can be subject to false claims liability on those claims. There is a six-year look back for the statute, which is pretty significant, so you're going to want to make sure your document retention policies are in line with that. The provider has 60 days from when an overpayment is identified. When looking at this, the commentary and the statute, identification means that you're confirming there was actually an overpayment, and then you're also quantifying the amount of the overpayment. So you need both of those elements to have an identified overpayment. So again, you have 60 days from when that, once that overpayment is identified to report and refund the overpayment. Before you get to that 60 days, you have up to six months to do an investigation into credible information of an overpayment. All Medicare overpayment demands are credible allegations and must be investigated. A hotline complaint can be credible information. 
an overpayment identified through normal billing compliance audits can be credible information. It's a really sort of fact-specific inquiry for what constitutes credible information. And that's something that can be determined internally through a compliance officer or a compliance team, or you can you know, engage the help of an attorney or a consultant. The thing that I found particularly striking about the commentary to this rule is that it specifically states that even a single overpaid claim triggers, triggers this obligation to investigate. So that means every time your billing team finds that there is a single overpayment that has been made by the government, you have an obligation to do this investigation and report and refund. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal and it's a pretty, uh, pretty strict statute and regulation. So how do you structure investigations for this? So the scope of the investigations are going to be really fact specific, um, but we do have some sort of pointers for what these what needs to be considered when structuring it. You're going to look at duration. So I'd mentioned earlier that there's a six year look back. Well, there really might be some very legitimate times where the reason for the overpayment is such that you don't need to go back the full six years. Let's say, for example, a year ago, you hired a new physician to work um, in your practice, and that physician was coding with a modifier that should not have been used, inadvertently, unintentionally, but the only time it happened was on that physician's benefit patients and only during the time that physician was there. So you really can justify having a single year or whatever the date of when that physician started submitting claims. You could justify a, a much shorter duration. You want to figure out if the overpayment is investigation should be limited to just specific codes. And in the example we just presented, it would be only the code that had that specific modifier, right? Again, it could be just a specific provider. It could be something much broader. Other things you're going to want to, to decide are, do you need a third-party consultant or an expert? Are you going to need a statistical um, expert, meaning that the scope of this investigation is so broad, it involves, you know, thousands of claims that couldn't possibly be reviewed within six months that you need to do an extrapolated overpayment refund. Um, you're going to want to bring an extrapolation expert on to help you determine the appropriate sample size and what needs to be reviewed and then to do the actual um, overpayment, extrapolated overpayment calculation. Do you want to engage an attorney? There are a lot of reasons to engage an attorney. The most important, I think, is to take advantage of the attorney-client privilege where possible. So we typically recommend that as soon as there's an overpayment identified, you get an attorney involved because then all the communications about that overpayment are protected by the privilege. Another benefit to getting an uh, attorney involved early is they can be the one to engage any experts or consultants that you retain so that communications and the work of those experts are also covered by the attorney-client privilege. And then finally, you know, as attorneys, we're, we do this all the time. You know, this is basically my niche area. I do it every day all the time. So I have a lot of experience in structuring these investigations and know the pitfalls to look for and know how to structure it in a way that will hopefully get you the best and most efficient process for getting the investigation moving forward. The other thing that is important is to, to take note of is the timeline, right? So you have six months to do this investigation, and then you have 60 days to report and refund. That, those six months will go by in a flash. And more often than not, an investigation that starts as a very narrow investigation inevitably will balloon into something much larger. So you're going to want to make sure that you're calendaring deadlines and deliverables and who's responsible for those deliverables. Um, one of the things that I do with all of my clients is I set up a weekly status conference with clients for the entirety of the eight-month period, the six months for the investigation and the two months for the report and refund so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page and that the investigation is actually moving forward and there's accountability. If there comes a week that we don't need it, then we can cancel it, but at least it's there and it's set and everybody knows it's happening. Another reason it's good to have an attorney on board is there are a number of ways that um, the overpayment can be refunded, and there's pros and cons to be weighed for each of those options. So it's good to have an attorney on board to, to help um, walk you through that analysis as well. Okay, great. Now, what kind of other disputes are there with payers, commercial or federal? There are a few other kinds other than reimbursement issues. 
I deal with enrollment disputes. So if um, somebody's provider enrollment has been suspended or revoked, we can work with providers to help them appeal that process or hopefully get that suspension terminated. There's also suspension of payments and prepayment reviews that can, can be part of an overpayment demand process, but are typically instituted prior to an overpayment demand letter being issued. So providers don't always recognize that, it's, that they're in the midst of that process. They're typically, you will get a notice of payment suspension after a medical records request has been responded to. So I would say four to six months at a minimum after that, so that the MAC has had time to review or the commercial payer has had time to review. And they will just suspend all payments that you get going forward, or they will require that you can that you must go through a prepayment review, which means you're not going to get paid until they see the, the supporting documentation. So we work with clients on navigating those and trying to get them terminated um, before they go on too long, because that can be a really big financial drain on, on our clients. I know that you think that we should have attorneys or consultants involved, but why would it be important to get them involved early in the process? Why would that be helpful? Yeah, so again, I know I recognize this sounds super self-serving and it's not meant to be. Um, it really is um, good advice. So the administrative process in particular with, with Medicare is, is really cumbersome and there are rules and guidelines and regulations that are difficult to weigh through. They're in a variety of locations that are hard to find. And it's really hard for providers to keep track of everything and to make sure that they're updated on everything. So legal counsel helps to flesh out all those legal administrative process arguments that are available to a provider during the process. And this is helpful also for commercial payers because so many of the commercial payers today just follow Medicare guidelines and rules or use them to a great extent in, in modeling their own rules. For as far as legal counsel, it's, it's really important to get them involved early so that you have time to develop these arguments. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the real main benefit of it is you want to protect your investigation, your analysis, your review, and your internal review process with the attorney-client privilege to the extent possible. Now, it's never 100% guarantee there are ways to pierce that attorney-client privilege, but without it, everything that you do, everything that you email, everything that you write down would be available to a government investigator or to anyone else who asks for it and has the authority to request that information. So if during the course of this investigation you have internal discussions where you say, oh crap, we shouldn't have done that, this is a real problem, instead of handing that documentation over to the government, that's protected by the privilege. The reason I think consultants are so important is because they provide the medical background and the coding expertise with the payers or with the process of billing and coding that attorneys just don't have typically. Um, most attorneys who are in this field are experienced enough to do issue spotting so that we can pick out the real problem areas just while looking at something. And we can say, you know, I'm really good at it, for example, with tox claims. We do tox claims a lot. And I can look at medical records and requisitions and tell you in two minutes the initial things that I've found wrong with it. We still recommend that you have a medical personnel who can look and delve into the, the medical things in the record and say, well, here's where your arguments are. Here's where you need to get backup or support to support this is an allowable claim. So that's really why I think that consultants are important because they really round out the arguments that can be made that providers just don't have the time to make or to research and maybe aren't equipped to make as well. So any other general practice tips? It's got a bunch. I won't go through them all. I will say the, the biggest one that I would say is just document, 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 because it's the most important thing from early on claim submission through documenting the process of an investigation or an appeal, or even just documenting your communications with the payer, whether it's federal or commercial, as you go through an, an appeal process. The sort of general rule for for Medicare, for documentation, is if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So just keep that in mind. You're going to want to review. Uh, another tip would be to make sure you review your policies and procedures and your training, right? You, you know, we made some recommendations today to have a policy in place for 
medical records request. I would also recommend having a policy in place for when an overpayment is discovered so that you can um, implement the, the required obligations under the 60-day rule efficiently and without scrambling around and losing some of that valuable time. You're going to want to keep documents organized whenever you make a submission to a payer whether it's a voluntary refund under the 60-day rule or going through the administrative appeal process or a commercial payer, you're going to want to be able to prove that you provided whatever papers you provided and make them as what I call dummy proof as possible so that they're easy to read for someone who's not familiar with your documentation. Um, we apply Bates numbering or Bates labeling to every single page. I've had Max come back and tell me, well, you didn't provide signed orders for these 10 patients, and I can go back to them and say, that's incorrect, and on pages 675, 543, and 247 are the signed orders for those beneficiaries, and then there's no doubt that they were provided. Those would be the main ones that I have. Great. Thank you so much, Courtney. I really appreciate you coming on to First Talk Compliance today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure to be able to speak with you all. Thank you. And thanks to our audience for tuning in to First Talk Compliance. You can learn more about our show on our programs page on healthcarenowradio.com and lend your voice to the conversation on Twitter at FirstHCC or hashtag FirstTalkCompliance. You can also email me at Katherine Short at FirstHCC.com. I'm Katherine Short of First Healthcare Compliance. Remember, compliance is the key to achieving peace of mind.